so far in our discussion about the immune system, we've talked about physical and chemical barriers. And what is probably the largest barrier that we have to infection? Skin. If a pathogen decides to try to find a different way into the deeper tissues of the body and they try to go through the respiratory tract, what kind of defense do we have in the respiratory tract? Mucus, nasty, sticky, slimy mucus. Now, if we get a real tricky pathogen and it tries to get in through the eye, what do we have there? Tears. And remember, your tears aren't just liquid that washes, but it has enzymes. Lysozyme, much like what we have in our saliva. But if somehow all those pathogens get past those chemical defenses and our physical defense and end up in our digestive system, what do they get to take a bath in? Acid, hydrochloric acid. Now, is hydrochloric acid only going to attack and destroy one specific pathogen? It's going to dissolve what? All of them, everything. Now, we do have some bacteria that love acidic conditions, acidophilus, that bacteria we have in yogurt. But most pathogens are not going to find that a hospitable environment. So we look at those defenses as being nonspecific in nature. Any pathogen, they're just going to keep them out. Your skin being a contiguous layer, that word that means all together, it's going to keep everything out. So as we look now at the cellular level, at our white blood cells, we're still looking at those white blood cells that are going to attack any pathogen, regardless of what it is. It knows it just doesn't belong. And last time we talked about macrophages, and we saw that sort of animated picture where the macrophage was reaching out and engulfing the bacteria. And that process we said was phagocytosis. And so we group these cells into the category of those cells that eat foreign material by engulfing it, much like an amoeba. We call them phagocytes. Our macrophages fit into that category. <clears throat> and another type of our white blood cells called neutrophils also will engulf foreign material and remove it. Neutrophils are smaller than macrophages, but the great thing about neutrophils is they are much more numerous. They're the most numerous white blood cell you have in your bloodstream. And so neutrophils are going to be the first white blood cells at the scene of the crime. Why? Because they're everywhere. There's so many of them. Now we also have a phagocytic type of white blood cell called a basophil. Now, the way we got these names, old histologists love to use dyes, stains, to color the cells to see them better under a microscope. So the fill part is short for philic or loving. So a neutral loving cell relative to the stain, what color do you think it's going to be? Normal neutral color. See? It's going to look like red blood cells, just neutral color. Basophils, what color do we typically associate with basic colors? Blue. So these are going to be really blue staining cells. So that's, that's all the names are referring to is just the color that they stain and look under the microscope. But we can associate them with their functions, neutrophils being the first on the scene, and basophils, in addition to engulfing the material like you see in the illustration here on the right, basophils are also going to use enzymes to break down these foreign materials. In fact, all the phagocytes do. They bring the food in. They engulf it in little vesicles, and then enzymes are dumped into those packages, and the material is essentially dissolved. The good stuff, the cell basically takes back into the cytoplasm by diffusion, and the undigestible material it basically gets eliminated from the cell. So neutrophils, macrophages, Basophils, basophils being less numerous, and they're going to play another role in the body as well. 
So principally, our phagocytes, and what I want you to remember, are the neutrophils and the macrophages. And when you have an infected cut, what is that nasty white stuff we talked about? Pus. That pus is going to be the dead neutrophils and macrophages that came in to eliminate the pathogen at the site of the infection. That's the most numerous cells that we're going to see there. Now, another type of white blood cell, in addition to our macrophages, neutrophils, basophils, we have these categories of lymphocytes, and we're going to call them B and T lymphocytes, but this particular flavor of T lymphocyte, it's going to destroy tumor cells and cells that are infected with a virus. These are called killer T cells. Some people call them cytotoxic T cells. And these T cells are going to have receptors. You see the little Y-shaped job on our killer T cell. I like the fact that they got the spikes on it, like a dog collar, you know. It's real tough. And as soon as this receptor, <coughs> excuse me, for a viral particle or a signal that that cell has a, is a tumor or part of a tumor, this killer T cell is going to attack that infected cell with enzymes or chemicals very similar to hydrogen peroxide. They're called superoxide ions. So you can think of a killer T cell as finding the infected cell and then throwing hand grenades at that cell until it completely destroys the cell so that one, the tumor can't spread, or if it's infected with a virus, you kill the cell before the viral particles can make millions and millions of copies. So that's going to be our killer T cell. Does it matter the virus? Does it matter the tumor? No, this is still non-specific. We're just going to get rid of any of those infected cells. Now, notice it doesn't play it role by itself because when you kill the infected cell and you have all this cell debris around, who's going to come gobble it up? There's a macrophage. Neutrophils are also going to play a role in that as well. So really nothing in the immune system is mutually exclusive. It's very dependent on the workings of other cells and other defenses in the body as well. <clears throat> All right, another response that the human body has to infection. And, and I'm sure we've all experienced this as well. When you twist your ankle, when you have that infection in a certain place, stuff's going to swell up. And swelling of an injured site is going to be called inflammation. Now, inflammation is not going to be specific for any one thing. You're, you're going to swell up if you bang yourself, if you cut yourself, if you get an infection. And so inflammation is another nonspecific means of trying to assist in eliminating pathogens from the body or repair an injured site. So really for inflammation, there are four cardinal signs. Now, in my science major classes, we call these the four ORs, Ruber, Caller, Dolder. We're not going to go into all those fancy schmancy words. When you get inflammation, there's redness. Have you ever had an injury and it's red all around it? Why do you think in an injury your skin becomes red? What's happening to cause your skin to become red? more blood flow. What do you think the advantage of having more, more blood flow to the site of the injury, what's that good for? Bringing more platelets if you've got a cut, but also bringing more white blood cells if you have an infection. So redness, you increase your circulation in the area of the injury. If you feel that place where you're getting a swelling, it's going to feel hot. That's also a result of increased blood flow because you're taking more of your core body temperature and let's say it's in your finger or out in your arm, it's generally cooler in your appendages 
So it's going to feel warm because of that increased circulation and increased body temperature. Now we get to the real signal of inflammation. You get swelling and enlarging in the tissue. But when you get increased circulation there, you get more blood. And remember, we've got the liquid portion of the blood, the plasma. Often when there's an injury, these white blood cells are signaling that, hey, we've got an infection. We have a pathogen out in our tissues. We need more help, more white blood cells to come to the scene of the crime. And many of these chemical mediators are going to cause your blood vessels to be leaky. And with your blood vessels being leaky, it's going to better facilitate the white blood cells going from the bloodstream out to the site of the infection. That's the real advantage, right? But when you open up these larger doors in your blood vessels, what else is going to get out other than the white blood cells? The liquid part, the fluid part, the lymph. Now, that's not a bad thing, is it? Remember when we talked about lymphatic system, that fluid washes the infection into your lymphatic capillaries and it takes them to the lymph nodes? Well, if you've got an infection, that's kind of what you want to do. But if you get more fluid entering the tissue than can leave, that's when things swell up. And swelling is an indication that you've got an infection, you've got an injury, something's going on. Now, when your tissue swells, you're building up a lot of hydrostatic pressure. You have pressure pushing on tissues that normally don't have this pressure pushing on them. And if you have pain receptors, how's that going to feel? It's going to hurt. So pain is typically a result of inflammation because of the swelling, because of the increased circulation that provides the redness and the warmth. Do you see how it just kind of builds like dominoes knocking one over at a time? Now, I'll tell you there is a fifth sign of inflammation. We don't have it on our list because it's the extreme, but it's called lack of function. Is anyone allergic to insect bites? Now, I'm, I'm not horribly allergic to them. Do you, do you swell up when you, something bites you? If a wasp gets me, yeah, I, I need some help pretty quick. Have you ever had a bite or bites more than one where you had a joint swell so much you couldn't move it? That's loss of function. That's extreme swelling. Now, there are other things that can lead to that. Uh, elephantiasis. Have you ever heard of elephantiasis? The elephant man syndrome where you got this big, huge... It's fluid in the appendages, and if you get that much swelling, you can't move them. So that would be the fifth sign, loss of function, but hopefully none of you are really going to experience that, and if you do, only temporarily. Because when we get when we get inflammation, a sprain, or we get a cut, and we're feeling warmth, and we're seeing red, what's one of the first things we're going to slap on that? Ice. We're going to put ice on. We won't want to make the swelling go away. What are we really trying to make go away? The pain. We don't like pain. I'm allergic to pain. I'm sorry. I am a wimp. But what are you doing? You're you're slowing your body's defenses down. This, your body's trying to get rid of the, the infection, and you're saying, no, 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 don't, don't get rid of the infection because I don't want to hurt, right? But again, everybody's going to put ice on, on an injury. Ma'am, did you have a question? Oh, now I'll let you get a mouthful of food, right? That's okay. So, an allergic reaction is going to, by and large, be inflammatory. But an insect bite, and I had trouble with ankles. we got some people live in this part of the world, East Texas, okay? Yellow jackets, do we know yellow jackets? If you get stung by one, you're going to get stung by 50. And I walked through a hedge, one of these box hedges, on a patio because I was too lazy to walk around, right? I'm a guy. We've decided that guys are lazy. So I walked through, and I was carrying a patio table. And when I got to the other side to put the patio table down, I'm like, man, my leg's burning. And I looked down, and it's covered in yellow jackets. I'm like, oh, I don't know what happened to the table. I think I dropped it. I don't care what happened to the table. 
My ankle swelled so much I almost didn't get my shoe off. The shoestrings were so tight. That's inflammation. When we get to the dangerous kinds of allergic reactions, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, that's when your airway starts to get inflammation. And your airway is not going to inflame out because you have these rings of cartilage around them. Which way is the inflammation going to cause the swelling to happen? Close the airway. It's called anaphylaxis and you can't breathe and yeah, that's going to be a dangerous situation. But I think we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yes and no. You've got the earwax, which is called sebum, and uh, it, it is going to get trapped there. However, your external ear canal is not connected to your eustachian tube. Okay, you have the eardrum, which is this wall. The external canal just goes from the outside to the eardrum. The eustachian tube connects behind the eardrum to your throat to equalize the pressure outside to inside. That's why when you fly, when you fly on a plane, or you're in an elevator that goes up or down really, really fast, your ears pop. That's your pressure equalizing on either side of the eardrum. And typically you have to chew gum, or what's another way to, to cause your eardrum to pop? Swallow. Swallow or yawn really, really big. That opens the eustachian tube to equalize the air pressure. Okay. So that the sebum and that wax, it, it just has to kind of come out. Do not put a Q-tip in your ear. Do not put a Q-tip in your ear. How many people have busted their eardrum with Q-tips? A bunch. I used to, my grandmother, you know what she'd clean her ears out with? A bobby pin. Yeah. I saw my dad doing it one day with a screwdriver. I'm like, y'all are stupid. Yeah. Uh, Doc told, said one time in a talk to students, the smallest thing you should put in your ear is your elbow. Let that sink in. You're going to get your... Yeah, what, no, so I mean, don't put anything in your, in your uh, ear. What were you saying on the increased blood flow? Were you saying that makes up with the more than the redness? Yeah, as the blood flow increases, your circulation increases, you have more oxygenated blood closer to that area. It's going to turn red. And because you've got more blood flowing there, more of your core body temperature, which is warmer, is going to be felt there. So you'll feel a temperature difference. It'll feel warmer. Because of more blood and it being leaky, you'll get the swelling. Because of the swelling, it's going to hurt. So let's look at inflammation, this, this process. We get an injury. We have these cells, and here where you see mast cell, I want if you if you've got your notes or if you've got the PowerPoint slide, either beside it or above it, write in mast, I mean write in basophil. A basophil is what you call the cell when it's in the circulation, when it's inside the blood vessel. When that basophil crawls out into your tissues, now we call it a mast cell. It's the same cell, we just use a different name depending on its location. Some people even refer a mast cell, they'll, they'll refer to it as a tissue basophil. Okay? So these are still phagos, those phagocytic cells but these cells also are capable, when they receive a signal that there's an infection going on, they produce histamine. Have you ever heard of histamine before? What word usually stands in front of histamine? Antihistamine. Now do you see why you're taking that medicine? To offset what's happening, what your body's trying to do to fight off the infection. Because we don't like having a stuffy, runny nose. Again, it seems like we try to do everything to work against the body because we don't like being uncomfortable. I'm the world's worst. Hey, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. All right? Histamine is going to be the chemical that causes the blood vessels to get leaky. The cells of your blood vessels are going to be, well, that big fancy word again, contiguous. They're going to be all, all together, very tight. But histamine is going to cause those cells to move apart and create little gaps that are going to cause the liquid portion to leak out, but also enable all of the other white blood cells to more freely leave the blood vessel and get into your tissues where the infection is. 
Now, histamine is also going to cause your blood vessel to dilate. Okay, when a blood vessel dilates, what happens to its diameter? Think of dilation of your pupil. It's going to get bigger. If a blood vessel gets smaller, we call that a constriction. So if histamine causes the blood vessel to be leaky and the blood vessel to get bigger, we're going to have greater blood flow. And again, the consequence of more blood, we'll have the redness in the area, and we'll have greater uh, core body temperature coming to that site, so it's going to be warmer. It's going to feel hot. And again, here comes the domino. Because of histamine, we're going to be leaky. Our plasma leaks out into the tissues, and there's our swelling. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, whenever you see a slide that has a list on it, I like lists. What does that mean? You're going to be on the yeah, it's going to be on the test. Then last, because of that increased pressure, we have those pain receptors that let us know something's not right here. Pa pain's not a bad thing, is it? Pain, pain tells you something's not right. Pain tells you whatever you're doing, stop. Don't make it worse. But we don't like pain. Mm -mm, not at all. As soon as I feel one funky little something, I'm taking an ibuprofen. Ice. Calling 911. Again, I'm a wimp. So here's an illustration that just walks through in a picture form. I'm, I'm a very much a visual learner. And so those steps we just had, you can see them here. First of all, what did we do to our skin in the upper left? We cut it. We broke it. There's a little splinter. Invariably, when you have a splinter, there's going to be bacteria that gets into the tissues deeper beneath the skin. Now here's our mast cell. What, what is our other name for the mast cell if it's in the circulation? A basophil, it encounters the bacteria and it says, whoa, you don't belong here. Let's send out the alarm. These chemicals are released, especially histamine. And you can see how the cells have sort of moved apart. They've gotten larger in diameter, so more of our white blood cells are coming out into the area of the infection. And now our phagocytic cells, macrophages, neutrophils, they're going to gobble up the pathogens to try to get rid of them. But at the same time, fluid's going to leak out. The tissue's going to get red. It's going to get warm. Swelling happens, and we'll feel pain until the infection has been alleviated. Does it matter what bacteria? Any pathogen. Inflammation is going to take care of any pathogen. So we're still talking nonspecific in nature. Oh boy, now we're really going to get into it. Fever. Fever is another nonspecific response to a pathogen. Now our normal temperature is around 98.6 plus or minus a couple of tenths. Do you know your body temperature goes up and down during the day or at night? It goes down at night and it goes up in the day. Because during the day you're active moving around and your muscles are generating what? Heat. So you warm up. At night, hopefully you're not moving around a whole lot if you're, if you're really sound asleep. And so your body temperature cools down. But we say our average temp is 98.6. So anything really above that is a fever. And many of our white blood cells, especially our macrophages that are going to be crawling around through our tissues all the time, when they encounter a pathogen, some of the chemicals they release are going to be called pyrogens. What does a pyromaniac like to do? Set fires. So a pyrogen is something that causes a higher temperature or fever. And the reason that we're trying to have a higher fever, number one, we're trying to kill the pathogens. Pathogens like a much narrower range of habitable conditions. Many pathogens are going to be denatured by higher temperatures. 
just like they're going to be denatured by changes of pH. But our white blood cells, when there is an increase in temperature, our white blood cells are going to go into overdrive. <clears throat> they're going to metabolize more rapidly. They're going to divide more rapidly. They're going to get ramped up to fight off the infection, and hopefully the infectious pathogen is going to have to slow down because it doesn't like being that hot. Now, I completely disagree with this okay at 99 degrees. I am not okay if I have 99 degree temperature. Anybody, anybody feel me? Anybody? Okay, all the guys are shaking their head yes. You ladies, y'all are like Wonder Women or something, especially moms. Moms can have 112 degree temperature and they're still cooking supper, doing the dishes, yelling at, you know, I don't, I don't know how moms keep going. But the last thing you want to mess with is a sick mom. She will take you out in a heartbeat. Am I lying? Am I lying? Mm -mm. You don't mess with a sick mom. But here's something I want to point out to you. Maybe it's something that you never thought of or maybe you did question it. When you have a really high fever, we'll say 102, how do you usually feel? You, 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 feel, you feel bad. You feel hot, right? But what's going to happen to your body when you have 102 fever even though you feel hot? Shivers, chills. Anybody ever had the chills? Your fever's so high you got the chills? Man, it hurts to the bone. Or, or you're under the covers, you know, and you're, you're hot under the covers, and you have to, like, go to the bathroom, and, and you get out, and that cold air hits you, and the, the chills hit you all of a sudden. I just, mm -mm, I just dive right back in. I just, I'll just wet the bed. I'm not getting out of there. <laughs> if you're burning up hot, why do you have the chills like you're in a bathing suit at the North Pole. Have you ever wondered about that? I've got the chills, but I'm burning up. Does that make any sense whatsoever? So let, let's, let's look at it this way. Right now, in this room, our body temperature is 98.6. Okay? Room temperature is going to be down here. We'll say, what, 70? 70, 72, maybe? How many people feel hot? How many people feel cold? How many people are comfortable? Okay. So we're, we're cold, right? Body temperature here, room temperature is here. How can you make the environment more comfortable? If you're cold, what are you going to do? If you have control of the thermostat, what are you going to do? Put on a jacket. And I'm like, there's always a smart one in here. <laughs> if you've got control of the thermostat, what are you going to do? You're going to turn on the heat, right? What you're going to do to feel more comfortable is you are going to make the difference between your temperature and the room temperature smaller. As you make that difference smaller, you feel warmer, right? Now, if we're too warm, what are we going to do to the air conditioner? We're going to turn it down. If we're warm, we're going to increase the distance so we feel cooler. You get it too much, you're going to get the chills, right? You see where I'm going? When you're sick and you have a fever, you're not changing the room temperature, but what are you doing to your body temperature? You're increasing the difference, and that difference between your body and the air temperature being so broad makes your body feel like it's cold, and it's automatically built to shiver to warm you up when there's that big a difference. And so what do you do? You put on two layers of sweats, two pair of socks, you put on a hood, you get under ten blankets, and you just lay there, right? Until your fever, what, breaks, and then what? You start sweating, because what have you done now? You've made that range much smaller, but you're comfortable under the... And so you start throwing clothes everywhere, kicking off the covers. That's why that happens. Plus, by having the, the chills and the shivers, your body's going to warm up even more to try to create a more inhospitable environment. But I don't like fever. I don't like chills. I'm taking Tylenol, ibuprofen, anything I can to knock that stuff down. Now, here's another thing that you need to put away for future reference. Unless you have 
small brothers or sisters or nieces and nephews. Anybody been around a baby with a fever? A high fever. Okay, now, when you have your first children, your baby, the first time you lift them up out of a crib and they feel like that little jack-jack off of, uh, yeah, you know, the one that just bursts into flames? You're, you're going to freak out. You're going to take their temperature and it's going to be 101 and you're going to be calling 911, the doctor, everything else. You know what they're going to say? Eh, give them Tylenol, check them in a couple hours. I'm like, did you not hear? They're 500 degrees. They don't get worried until you get above this 103, 104 for these kids. Kids are like made out of plastic. I don't know. But if you have a child that has an extremely high fever, 102, 103, still check with the doctor. But you can alternate. Have anybody heard of this? Alternate the ibuprofen with acetaminophen, which is Tylenol. You know, if they say give it every six hours, well, give the ibuprofen, and then three hours, give the acetaminophen. So it cuts the time in half. And for my kids, knock the fever out. I mean, almost instantly. But write this number down, too, as we're talking about fever. 105. 105 degrees, brain cells start to die. So you're 103 for a kid. You still need to get them to the doctor. The emergency room, even though they're probably going to say, oh, it's not uncommon for a child. It's like, mm, not my baby. An adult with 105, they're probably not going to be very responsive. And in that case, you need to get them in a cool bath. Don't, don't put them in ice water. They'll go into shock. You can also take uh, rubbing alcohol and do like a sponge bath. The alcohol evaporates more rapidly than water, and so it will dissipate the heat more quickly. But again, those are temporary things until you can get them to the emergency room ASAP. 105, that's the danger number. Okay. So inflammation, skin, hydrochloric acid, all of these nonspecific means of trying to gear your body to fight off a pathogen, that's great. But if we need to take really, really extreme precautions to knock down these pathogens. We're gonna switch over now to our specific defenses. The defenses that are looking for one pathogen and only one pathogen to eliminate. Now, instead of talking about the pathogen as a whole, the whole bacteria, now we're gonna talk about these things that are called antigens. And really the term antigen stems from antibody generating substances. And these are going to be small pieces of protein or small segments of carbohydrates that are going to be on the surfaces of these pathogens that can be recognized by the cellular receptors on these white blood cells. And specifically these receptors are going to be called MHC proteins, major histocompatibility markers. And these MHC proteins, they are going to recognize foreign materials, but these are also going to be the uniform or the number, if you will, for our immune system cells that says you belong to this person. That's why when you have to give or get an organ transplant, it's not enough just to match the blood type. You know, you have to be a really, really close match to, to donate an organ to someone. And who typically is going to be the best donor? A sibling. Not mom and dad aren't even right because there's been genetic recombination of sibling. Because those MHC markers are going to be more closely similar to each other. And those have to match. Otherwise, the immune system of the person that's getting the organ is going to attack that entire organ as being foreign, and you're going to get tissue, what? What do we call it when your body doesn't accept an organ? Rejection. The rejection is going to be because your immune system didn't recognize those MHCs and saw them as foreign and said, ah, we got to get rid of it, just as if it were a pathogen. <clears throat> now, the cells involved 
in our specific defenses. These are going to be another set of lymphocytes. And we've already talked about the, the killer T lymphocytes, right? Well, the T lymphocytes are called T because they mature in the thymus. It's a lymphoid organ. It sits sort of in the middle of your chest, just above the heart. And it's where these T cells, these T lymphocytes, become immunocompetent. And what's really, really weird about these T cells is they're formed in the bone marrow, but then they go through the circulation and set up house in the thymus. But once they're in the thymus, they get screened two times. They get screened, number one, to make sure their MHC receptors work well. And then they get screened again to make sure their MHC receptors do not recognize self antigens. If they would recognize self antigens, we'd have an autoimmune disease. You wouldn't want that. So of all the T cells that make it to the thymus, what percent of those T cells do you think are actually released into the circulation after they get checked out twice? Anybody want to guess? 70%? 50%? What do you think? What would be a reasonable number, all these T cells going to the thymus, what's a reasonable number to expect that are going to be released to actually defend your body? Huh? 10%. Double it. Only 20. Did you say 20? Did you get it? Oh, okay. All right. You didn't say it loud enough, man. You got that deep voice. I didn't hear it all the way over. No. 20%. But does that, does that seem crazy? Your body makes all these cells, but only 20% are good? But that's how careful your body has to be when it's releasing these cells so it doesn't attack you. That doesn't work all the time, right? We still have autoimmune diseases in our body. But the body is doing its best to protect it. Now, we also have B lymphocytes. And for humans, we can use this B for bone marrow because that's where these cells live. That's where they mature. That's where they become immunocompetent. So T cells, thymus, B cells, bone marrow. Now, that, that's the location of what they do. But their actual function, <coughs> much like we saw with our killer T lymphocytes, our T cells are responsible for what is referred to as cell-mediated immunity, that direct attack that we saw for those tumorigenic or those virally infected cells. So here's a different illustration showing a cytotoxic or killer T cell. There's the killer T MHC molecule, and there we have that molecule on the infected cell. When you match those up with the virus in place, then this T cell is going to kill that infected cell with those hand grenades, remember? Cytotoxic T cell. Another pretty cool thing that these cytotoxic T cells will do is they will poke holes in the cell membrane of an infected cell. They have these proteins called perforins. No, perforate. And these proteins assemble into these little pores that then will insert themselves into the membrane of the infected cell and you basically poke all these holes in it and all the cytoplasm leaks out and the cell dies. So there are a number of ways, but it's going to be direct contact between our T cell and the infected cell that's going to help to eliminate it before it becomes a, a bigger problem. Now, B cells. B cells are going to be that lineage of lymphocyte that are going to lead to the production of antibodies. And antibodies are these proteins that are free-floating. Many of them are in your plasma already. And it's going to be these molecules that are going to bind to the pathogens that can help handcuff the pathogens together. Because you see this Y-shaped antibody molecule, it can bind two pathogens much like you can handcuff two criminals together. And as you start handcuffing all these pathogens together in these larger and larger mats or rafts, it's going to be harder for those pathogens to infect tissue and easier for our macrophages and neutrophils to find them. So here's our illustration. Here's a B cell. It's showing it spitting out all these antibodies. 
and these antibodies are going to bind to, in this case, these viruses. Maybe it's a part of a bacteria. Here's our illustration showing pathogens. And you see the little triangles on the pathogens? Those are the specific antigens, the recognition molecule that the antibodies are actually going to bind to. You see how each of these has bound one antibody? And then with the other arms of the antibodies, now we can link them together. They're not just three free floating now. They're all tied together. And with them being all tied together, here comes our phagocytic cell. It's going to have a much easier time gobbling it up. The other thing about antibodies, the, the sort of leg, the stand of the antibody, that's like chocolate to a macrophage. So that macrophage is going to see all of those antibody legs and go, oh, that's my favorite. And that's going to help it gobble it up even faster. Each B cell, based on its development and based on the recombination of the genes for antibodies, each B cell can make antibodies against different antigens. So we'll say we have B cell 1 and B cell 2. B cell 1 may produce an antibody against the chickenpox virus. But B cell 2 may produce antibodies against Pseudomonas bacteria. But that's all that B cell's ever going to make, antibodies against that one bacteria. B cell 1's only ever going to make antibodies against that one virus. And so the trick with the B cells is how do you get the right B cell that can recognize the pathogen in the right place at the right time. Well, one way is to bring that pathogen in the lymphatic system to the lymph node where we have a ton of B cells. But the B cells have receptors on their surface that are identical to the antibody they can make. Think of it like this. Uh, most of you live in apartments, right? Okay. You're hungry, you go to the pantry. You look in the pantry at your canned foods. How do you know what's inside the can? Because you can't see what's inside the can. The label, what's usually on the label. A picture that hopefully resembles what's inside the can. Well, think of the receptors on the B cells as the label that shows what antibodies that cell's going to make and what's inside of it. It's usually at this time that I tell a prank, one of the meanest, best pranks we ever played on one of my buddies in college. I forget what he did. He Vaseline somebody's door handle or some silly, stupid prank. Well, he made the mistake of leaving his apartment open one day. So we went and peeled all the labels off his canned food. So for about, for about the next month, every meal was a surprise. That's how you end up eating hominy and, you know, uh, asparagus, huh? SpaghettiOs. Yes, yeah, spag no, SpaghettiOs are good, man. What are you talking about? Man, I lived on SpaghettiOs and peanut butter when I was in college. The greatest semester in college ever, the greatest semester ever, one of our friends was the assistant manager at McDonald's on North Street. So at like 2 o'clock, a couple of times a week, he would come over and he would bring all the leftover food. You know you're poor when you're trying to hork down a week old cheeseburger. And a microwave can't even touch it. But oh, that was that was great. He would bring salads every now and I was like, man, salad, what are you doing? Where's the Big Mac? Come on. So do you understand though? The B cells can make the antibodies, but the way they know when to start making them is when something binds to that very specific receptor. And not only that, but when the pathogen binds to that receptor, and now you know there's a match. Not only are those B cells going to begin to lead to the production of antibodies, but they're going to start cloning themselves. They're going to start dividing rapidly. And they're going to make more and more copies of themselves so that they can make more and more what? Antibodies. And the greater amount of antibodies, the greater chance you're going to have to get rid of this particular pathogen. <clears throat> now that's going to be important. And you need, you need to remember this. The activation of B cells 
making copies of themselves because we're going to talk about vaccinations. Vaccinations are going to play a big role and use this mechanism to our advantage. Bless you. <coughs> now, B cells themselves, listen very carefully. This is one of my pet peeves in biology. B lymphocytes themselves do not make antibodies. I know we've been talking about B cells making antibodies so far, but I said we'd start simple and get a little more complex. B cells have that label, and when the pathogen binds to the label and turns it on, and that B cell starts dividing and cloning itself, it's going to do so and it's going to make two different flavors of itself. One flavor is going to be called a plasma cell. This is the form of the B cell that actually produces and secretes the antibody. But this next part is where our vaccines come in. Because in addition to making the active plasma cells, which I, I want you to think of the plasma cells as the pitcher that's in the game, the pitcher on the mound throwing antibodies, right? What happens if that pitcher gets tired halfway through the game? What do you got to do? You got to go to the bullpen, right? That pitcher that's been sitting waiting. Memory cells are the bullpen pitchers. That B cell starts making more and more and more copies of itself. Most of those cells are going to start making antibodies right away. But some of the cells that are made in the process are going to be memory cells. It's cells that are held in reserve. They're not going to make antibodies again, but they have that same label. Because this is a built-in system. If your body encountered this pathogen, chances are down the road your body's going to encounter it again. And so the first time you encounter a pathogen, you might have just a few of these initial B cells, but the next time you encounter that pathogen, you're going to have thousands of memory cells that are going to be able to attack that pathogen a lot quicker. Keep that in mind again as we move toward vaccinations. That's a big part of how it's going to work. So here we see we've got a ton of B cells. Notice how they have different receptors. There's like a triangle, there's a square, there's sort of a curve. <clears throat> and when we get the right receptor, the right label of that B cell bound to the antigen, here comes the cloning process. Look at all the plasma cells that we make and all the antibodies they're making. And look, a couple of these cells are going to be memory cells that we hold in reserve for the next infection. All right? So... When we first encounter a pathogen, our body is going to do what is called a primary immune response. And in a primary immune response, it's going to take a while for that pathogen to come into contact with the right B cell because you don't have a lot of them. First time you've ever seen this thing. And it may take three days, six days. It may even take close to two weeks for your body to start making antibodies. And certainly, it's going to take 10 to 14 days before your antibody levels are going to peak. And that peak of antibody level is not going to be very high. So if it's taking you two weeks from the initial infection, how are you going to feel? You're going to be sick. You're going to have symptoms. And that's what happens the very first time you encounter that particular pathogen. But you've had your two, three weeks, you, you feel better. Six months down, that pathogen is back. But now you've got a ton of memory cells around because now you're in a secondary immune response. So we're not going to wait a week plus to make antibodies. How fast is your body going to make antibodies in a secondary immune response? A few hours. Not just start making antibodies faster, but here we're going to get a little trickle, you know, of antibodies coming out. Here we're going to make a tidal wave, a tsunami of antibodies. And those antibodies are going to be around for probably a couple of weeks longer than the level of antibodies we saw here in a primary immune response. 
So you attack it faster, you overwhelm it. Are you going to have any symptoms whatsoever in a secondary immune response? None. You're not even going to feel sick at all. Are you getting the idea of what we're going to do with vaccinations now? A vaccination, is that going to stimulate a primary or a secondary immune response? Primary immune response. You're going to be vaccinated. You're going to be given a pathogen that can't infect you. But that pathogen is going to have all the same antigens on the surface so that your immune system doesn't realize that it's a dead virus or a dead bacteria or inactivated. It's going to think it's the real thing. And so it makes all these memory cells against that pathogen. Let's say it's the chicken pox virus. So when varicella ross or the chicken pox virus infects you again, guess what? You don't itch once, you don't get a temperature, you don't get one bump. Your body gets rid of it that fast. That is the process of vaccination. This just gives you a little idea. This is the first exposure. Here we see the peak of antibodies about, you know, two weeks. So that's just a little bitty bump, right? Good grief, look at the skyrocket of antibody production. Instantly, few hours. And that level peaks, not at 14 days, but before seven, and it stays with you a whole lot longer. So, you're never going to feel anything. Your body completely knocks it out. So, your vaccinations, meningitis, chicken pox, what else do we get vaccinated against? Hepatitis, measles, mumps, rubella, all those things you get as kids. Huh? Yeah, HPV, I know that a, a, was a popular one a couple of years ago. <clears throat> but that is called active immunization before you get an infection. And we talk about vaccination. Have you ever heard that term, vaccine? Sometimes we think vaccination for our animals. We don't think of vaccination for people. Vaccination. You ever, ever wonder where we get that name from? Back in the day of smallpox, when smallpox was wiping out thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, there was a naturalist, they didn't call them scientists in the day, but he observed that these ladies that were milking the cows, milkmaids, he noticed that they got the pox, the bumps, the welts, but they didn't die. And he hypothesized that, you know what, maybe this disease that the cows have, they call cowpox, maybe these milkmaids are getting something from the cows in this disease that's protecting them from the severity of the human smallpox disease. I know it's going to be gross, but what did he do? He took a needle and he dipped it into the bumps and the welts of the cows, these oozy, mucousy pox. And then he scratched it on the skin of people. And they got cowpox, which is less virulent. Do you remember that term from Monday? Less virulent, less damaging. But it's similar enough to smallpox that when the smallpox got in the human, guess what? They were vaccinated against it. They had a secondary immune response. They didn't get sick. They didn't die. So from his work with cows came the term vaccination. Because vaca in Latin means what? Cow. Vaca means cow. It's weird sometimes how these are. Cow? How in the world do you get cow from a shot, you know? But that's where it came from because cows were first used as the vaccine or the agent to give us a primary immune response. <clears throat> now, passive immunization, this is where you get ready-made antibodies. Now, these days, uh, if you get uh, any kind of venom bitten by a snake, a lot of times you will go and they will give you an anti-serum, an anti-venom. It's going to be ready-made antibodies that were produced probably in a different species, a horse or a goat. And they take those antibodies, put them in your body. The antibodies bind to the toxin before the toxin can bind to your cells to cause the damage. Now, has anyone, anyone in here received ready-made antibodies? Anybody received ready-made antibodies? Okay, everybody raise your hands. 
Everybody raise your hands. Everyone in here has received ready-made antibodies. Who'd you get it from? Mom, when you were a baby, when you were in the womb, there are a lot of antibodies that cross the placenta. And so for the first couple of days of your life, you had a passive immune system because your mom's antibodies were protecting you. You, though, didn't have the B cells and the memory cells to fight off an infection yourself. So over time, you know, two, three weeks later, now you've lost that protection. But you get a little bit if you breastfeed because antibodies are present in breast milk. It's very similar antibodies that you have in your tears. Did you know you had antibodies in your tears? So that's a passive immunity that you receive from mom when you're in the womb, when you're breastfeeding. But once all that stops, then you've got to get these injections, these passive vaccinations that are going to contain ready-made antibodies that can help. Now, this is quite a bit different. We talked about antibodies, antibodies, antibodies. Antibiotics are not antibodies, even though it sounds kind of the same. Anti means against. Bios means life. And so antibiotics are agents that kill bacteria or at least keep them from growing. And penicillin was the first antibiotic that, that was found. Have you heard the story about how they found penicillin? Guy was doing an experiment for the military. He was trying to, I forget exactly what he was trying to identify, but he had these plates of bacteria and he was trying these various chemicals and nothing was working and he got mad. So he just left all his Petri dishes and stuff, he just left them out and just took the weekend off. And when he came back and he was cleaning up, he saw in some of his dishes that there were spots where the bacteria were dead. He's like, what the heck? That's what I've been trying to find. And guess what was causing the bacteria to die in the Petri dish? bread mold from a sandwich that he had eaten that accidentally had fallen into the dish. I'm like, man, I don't know if I'm going to eat a moldy sandwich. Got to be hungry for that. I didn't eat moldy stuff in college. I looked at it a couple of times. I'm like, uh, not that hungry. But it was just accident. But antibiotic. We have penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin. We have tons of antibiotics. But you realize, too, that we have bacteria that exist that we have no antibiotics that will kill. Do you know that? They're called superbugs. And how do these superbugs develop? Overuse of what? Antibiotics. We did it to ourselves. And you're all equally as guilty as me, so don't look at me. When you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you a prescription, right? What do you do as soon as you get that prescription because you feel bad? You start taking your medicine, right? What do you do as soon as you feel fine? Stop taking the medicine. You stop taking the medicine. And if it's an antibiotic and if you have a bacterial infection, what you're essentially doing, if you don't take that antibiotic for the full stretch that the doctor says, is you've eliminated most of the bacteria. And most of the bacteria are the ones that are most susceptible to the antibiotic. But what's left? The toughest bacteria. The bacteria that just kind of laughed at that antibiotic, right? So when you stop taking it, what do they do? They grow back. Now you start feeling bad again, you go to the doctor, and you get the same antibiotic. It doesn't do anything, so it uses a stronger and You see what's happened? through our population and through the overuse of antibiotics. Because when we go to the doctor, we don't want him to tell us, oh, go rest, take ibuprofen, drink lots of fluids. No, give me medicine. I want to feel better. Right? So that's one of the main reasons we have these super bugs that are around. And with all our technology, it seems crazy that we have bacteria that we don't have antibiotics for. I mean, how many millions of dollars are spent in the pharmaceutical industry every year and we don't have antibiotics for some stuff? 
Why, why do you think pharmaceutical companies aren't making antibiotics that can fight off these superbugs? Had no money in it. How many people get infected by superbugs? Not enough to justify the expense of developing the antibiotic. Right? Man, some of these, some of these superbugs, depending on how bad the infection is, yeah, it can be fatal. Um, Flesh-eating bacteria, for one, that, that's going to be some of these superbugs that you've got to have a long, strong regimen of antibiotics to knock it down. But the tissue that they've damaged, depending on the extent of it, it's not going to come back. It's not going to grow back. So, um, yeah, uh, it's unfortunate that our society is about money, but. I mean, health insurance, for instance. Are people in the business of health insurance to help you? What are they in the business to do? Make money. So what do they want you to do? They want you not to get sick. They want you to pay your premiums and never use them. Why? Because they make money. So in a lot of ways, health insurance has really shaped health care I, I don't have the answer, and please, I'm not trying to tell you what to think or what not. I'm just trying to maybe open your eyes to some things that maybe you haven't thought about before. So Now, we've already mentioned tissue rejection, right, with the organ donation, that if you don't match those MHC molecules, yeah, your body's going to recognize it as foreign, attack it, cytotoxic T cells, making antibodies against it, inflammation, everything it can to get rid of that foreign material as if it was just a big, ginormous pathogen. Allergies. Allergies are where you have these basophils, these mast cells. And what was that chemical that we said that they make that makes your blood vessels leaky and sneezy? Histamines. Allergies are where you have a certain set of antibodies on the surface of these mast cells that recognize these allergens, pollen, dog dander, um, peanuts, seafood, you know, people that have these different types of allergies. And when you expose your body to these allergens, it activates these mast cells. And if you have a powerful enough reaction if you have a ton of these mast cells in your system when these allergens bind and you see at that bottom picture how the allergens are binding to two different antibodies on the surface that cross links those receptors and it brings them close enough together that it activates the mast cell inadvertently and if you get enough of this allergen and you have enough of those mast cells that histamine floods through your entire body. A systemic allergic response. All of the blood vessels in your body get leaky at the same time, including the ones in your airway. Your airway is going to close. You're going to have trouble breathing. What's going to happen to your blood pressure if all your fluid is leaking out into your tissues? It's going to plummet. You're going to start to go into shock. And this type of response is called anaphylactic shock. That's when you have the most severe allergic response. And it's a normal response. It's just way too many of these mast cells inadvertently stimulated by an allergen. It's not really a pathogen. I mean, peanuts aren't pathogenic. I love peanut butter. And I could live on peanut butter. I did for four years. But it's how your body responds. Now, one more thing about allergies. Does anyone in here have that type of anaphylactic, and it's typical like a food allergy? Any, anybody got? It's to cats, though. It's to what? Cats. Cats. You don't have a cat, right? No. Okay, good. <laughs> Do you know someone that has this type of severe allergy? You have to make sure that those people have this one thing with them at all times, an EpiPen. What does the epi stand for? Epinephrine. What's another word for epinephrine? Huh? I'm, I'm sorry. Well, you're thinking, I think you're thinking norepinephrine. 
But epinephrine, another name for it, is adrenaline. Adrenaline activates your body. And that fight or flight, when you're really, really scared, like the Incredible Hulk with all the adrenaline, gets your body to do something really active. Part of that response is your airway dilates. That's what the epinephrine is doing. It's causing your airway to open so you can breathe again. So if someone you know has an EpiPen, has that kind of allergy, they need to make sure they have an EpiPen wherever they are. They don't just need to leave it at home and come to school. <laughs> what happens if you have an allergic response here? The other thing you need to make sure they do is have some sort of medical alert, bracelet, jewelry, something on. Because if they pass out and just a stranger comes up to help or a first responder, how are they going to even know? There might be an EpiPen in their backpack. And if they're having an allergic response, they're not going to know. But if they see the medical alert bracelet, if they see that this person is having an allergic response, they could save their life. Now, if you're not having an allergic response and somebody gives you the EpiPen, you're going to be on like high humongous caffeine for a while because it's ugh. But you're not going to die from it, right? Better safe than sorry. So make sure we keep our people safe. Now, we mentioned how the T-cells in the thymus are screened so carefully to prevent autoimmune disorders. Well, sometimes that happens. Lupus is a type of autoimmune response, and it's not an uncommon thing anymore. But it's going to attack your connective tissues. Where do you have connective tissues in your body? Everywhere. So lupus is a tremendously horrific disorder. Rheumatoid arthritis. This is not, there's some arthritis that can be caused by uh, autoimmune responses, but rheumatoid arthritis is going to be an inflammation of the membranes of your joints, those synovial joints, your knees and your elbows. And this inflammation slowly over time is going to lead to the degradation of the cartilage that's covering the ends of your bones. And if you don't do something about it pretty soon, you're going to have bone-on-bone -bone contact, which apparently is one of the most excruciatingly painful things you can experience because bone's not meant to slide across each other, especially in your joints. Now, that brings us to AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. What's going to be happening in the course of AIDS? is the HIV, notice I'm not going to say virus, remember, HIV pathogen, it recognizes a receptor on your T cells, your own immune system cells. And what the HIV is going to do is it's going to bind to that receptor on the T cell and it's going to get inside the T cell. So initially, when you're infected with HIV, you're going to get sick. You're going to run a little bit of a fever. You're going to feel icky. You're going to go to the doctor, and the doctor's going to say, oh, you probably have a what? You got a virus, cold. Take your Tylenol, get some rest. In two weeks or so, you feel fine. So what do you think? I just had a cold. No, you didn't have a cold, but HIV's gone to sleep. And you're going to be in a latent period of HIV infection that may last 10 months years. And over the course of that 10 years, HIV is going to be replicating itself. It's going to be killing your T cells and making more of itself until after those 7 to 10 years, your T cells and basically your immune system is completely destroyed. At which time the virus is going to completely infect your body destroying the rest of your T cells and your immune system and then you're going to get an infection like pneumonia that typically your body could fight off pretty easily but the pneumonia is going to kill you because you have zero immune system left because HIV's killed all of your T lymphocytes. That's the scary part about HIV. Now, you're not sick for those 10 years, right? Are you infectious during that time? Yes. Absolutely. So you, you don't know that you have HIV. 
You don't feel bad, but you do, and you're infectious. So what is, what is the saying about who you're really having sex with? You're not having sex with just that one person. You're having sex with everyone they had sex with. So protect yourself.